uh, Aloha Biochem. In the second lecture of chapter four, we take a look at Lewis structures and molecular shapes. So we're continuing chapter four. This time we're gonna look at some more complex covalent compounds and uh, take a look at their Lewis structures and also determine their molecular shapes. So this is my cat Hershey. Hershey is uh, being a nuisance. And uh, I figure if I put her in the video, she'll maybe pipe down a little bit. So I don't think she's too happy about being in the video. <laughs> so let me put her down. Please don't claw me, Hershey. All right, there you go. Okay, so what we'll do this time is we will take a look at several examples of covalent compounds, maybe 10 or 11 examples, um, and we will uh, get their Lewis structures and their molecular shapes and determine you know, whether or not they are polar and then name them. So remember that's the goal of the chapter. Last time we, we mentioned what the main goal is. If you're given a chemical formula, you should be able to draw the Lewis dot structure of the molecule, assign its three dimensional shape, determine whether or not it's polar, and then of course name it. Now the Lewis structure is the most involved step. And in the last video, we uh, did this for several uh, easy examples that we did the molecular elements. This time we're going to do some compounds and uh, we'll kind of progress to, to more complex molecules. So the first example isn't too bad. Uh, here we have CO2. Now this is the stuff that we exhale. So we breathe in oxygen and after it does its job in the body, we exhale CO2. To get the Lewis structure, I'll remind you of the steps. First, you draw the Lewis dot structures of each atom in the formula. So you got one carbon and two oxygens. So here are the dot structures of the atoms. Carbon is in group 4A on the periodic table. And remember, every element in group 4A gets four dots. Oxygen is in group 6A, so it gets six dots. So there you go. Those are the dot structures. And then once you have the dot structures, you, uh, you position the atoms next to each other and you match up any unpaired electrons. Now to do this, you might wonder, you know, how do I position the atoms? You know, do I put, you know, the atoms in a, uh, in a triangle or, 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 you know, one here, one there, one there, you know, how do I move these atoms around to position them next to each other? You see, these are like puzzle pieces and you gotta position them properly. Well, I'll give you a clue. When you see a formula and you see one atom and then multiple other atoms of another type, think symmetry. The atoms that you have more than one of are going to surround the one. And 99% of the time that will get you to the correct Lewis structure. If you do, try and do it the other way, if you put, you know, oxygen in the middle and you put carbon on one side and another oxygen on the other side, that's not really symmetrical. You're going to run into problems. You're going to, you know, run into issues with the octet rule, or maybe you're going to have a non-common bonding pattern. You know, these issues that we discussed in the previous video. So go ahead and put carbon in the middle and surround it by the oxygens and uh, match up any unpaired electrons. So you see these two match up, those two match up. But don't forget about the other unpaired electrons as well. You see this one on carbon uh, doesn't want to be left out and you know electrons like to pair up. So how about bring this one and that one to form another match right there and then the other one on carbon and that one to form another match right there. The reason you do that is because you want each atom to have an octet. You see, without doing that, this central carbon, you know, 
it only has six electrons associated with it. So it doesn't yet have its octet. And this oxygen doesn't either. So it only has seven. By matching up the additional electrons, these two go here and maybe these two go there, now each of the atoms has an octet. Okay, so there you go. The atoms are positioned correctly and the electrons are ready to bond. So go ahead and pair them up, form those bonds, and that will get you the Lewis structure of the molecule. So here it is. This is the correct Lewis structure. And you can verify that it's correct by checking the bonding patterns of each atom. You see carbon has two double bonds and you can go and check the the, you know, the bonding patterns of carbon, you know, carbon likes to have one of these bonding patterns. And you can see that this is the one that is in our molecule CO2. And the oxygens look like that. Oxygen likes to form two bonds and it's either two singles or maybe a double. And in our case, it's a double. So the oxygens, you know, both have a double. See, there you go. The bonding patterns and also the octet rule verify that this is a good structure. So now that we have the Lewis structure, we assign the three-dimensional shape. That's the next step. To get to the three-dimensional shape, uh, we will be using uh, table 4.2 in the textbook. And to use table 4.2, we look at the central atom and we count how many groups around the central atom. A group is either another atom that it's connected to or a lone pair on the central atom. So when I look at the central atom carbon, I count one, two atoms that it's connected to and I'd see no lone pairs, okay? So that's two groups total around carbon. And then I go to the I go to the table 4.2. And then table 4.2, uh, uh, the, the first column is the number of groups. So I'm looking for two groups. Okay, there it is at the at the beginning, two, three or four, so two. And I'll just verify that yes, it's two atoms and no lone pairs. So that's two plus zero is two groups total. And then this table tells us the shape. The shape is linear, okay? So carbon would be in the middle, and then one oxygen would be over here, and the other oxygen would be over there. So it's a linear molecule. The bond angle between the two oxygens is 180 degrees. You see, the, the Lewis structure that we just got, it doesn't usually tell us the molecular shape, it just tells us how the atoms are connected. But really, this Lewis structure just says that you have an oxygen connected to a carbon, and that carbon is also connected to another oxygen. But the, the molecule could be shaped like an L. You could have oxygen, carbon, oxygen. You know, it could be another angle. It could be, a, you know, a smaller angle. But it turns out that it's actually linear. Okay, that table tells us that no, it's not an L-shaped molecule. It's not some other angle. It's, an, it's a perfect line. These three atoms all line up because anytime the central atom is surrounded by two groups, it is linear. And I'll show you a model of uh, carbon uh, or CO2. So here it is. You have all three atoms lining up perfectly. This is a linear molecule. CO2. Now, is this molecule polar? So we got the Lewis structure, we got the shape. The next step is determining whether or not it's polar. Is it a polar molecule? In other words, does one side of the molecule have more electrons than the other side? Well, remember when you're determining polarity, you you need the help of another figure in the textbook. And uh, there's another figure that, that helps us uh, determine polarity and that's figure 4.4. So I'll show you that. Here it is. And figure 4.4 is, is the electronegativity 
chart for all the atoms. And what it tells us is each atom's ability to pull electrons. So here we have carbon connected to oxygen through a double bond there, and then carbon connected to oxygen through a double bond there. So what we're looking for is in this double bonded, um, in this double bond here and in that one there, are they shared equally between oxygen and carbon? Or does maybe the oxygen pull that shared, you know, those shared electrons closer towards it or does carbon pull it towards it? And you can see from the electronegativity table that oxygen has a higher electronegativity than carbon. So oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So these electrons in the double bond are not quite, quite shared equally. They're, they're pulled closer to the oxygen. Uh, and so you might think this molecule is polar because oxygen's pulling it this way, but don't forget the other one. It's pulling it the other way and in the exact opposite direction. So you have these electrons being pulled that way and then those electrons being pulled this way. And, and so it's like an equal tug of war. And you cannot really say that the molecule has a negative side and a positive side because it's an equal tug of war. Uh, they're being pulled equally on both sides of the carbon by the oxygens. And so, you, you know, although you could say that this bond may be distributed unequally, the other one is also distributed unequally in the opposite direction. And so they kind of cancel out those, those polar bonds you know, cancel out and the molecule as a whole is nonpolar. Okay. So that's how you determine the polarity. You have to look at each bond and then see, do they cancel out? Or maybe if they don't cancel out, the molecule would be polar. So we got the Lewis structure. We got the shape. Uh, we determined it was nonpolar. Now, how do we name it? Well, to name covalent compounds is pretty simple. You just count up each atom in the formula. You got one carbon and two oxygens. And so you look up the prefix for one, it's mono. The prefix for two, it's di. And so you can name it using these prefixes. It's mono carbon di oxygen. That's how you start. But the last element in the formula always ends in ide. So it's mono carbon dioxide. Mono carbon dioxide. Now there's a little catch. Anytime you use the mono prefix on the first element in the formula, you can drop it. So instead of mono carbon dioxide, you can just call it carbon dioxide. And that's the name of the substance. And uh, you've definitely heard of this. This is what we exhale after we breathe in oxygen. So this is uh, carbon dioxide. And, and that molecule that we, that we saw before the model, that's, a, that's what carbon dioxide molecules look like. They're, they're linear, uh, the, the atoms all line up. Okay, so the next example is BF3, that's boron and that's fluorine. So here is the formula. Now remember the main goal is given a formula, get the Lewis structure of the molecule, determine its shape, whether or not it's polar and name it. So given the formula, let's first get the Lewis structure. And to do that, you draw the dot structures of each of the atoms. Boron is in group 3A, so it gets three dots. And then fluorine is in group 7A, so it gets seven dots. And so those are the dot structures. Now that you have them, you position the atoms next to each other. And using that symmetry, a helpful hint again, you put the boron in the middle and surround it by the fluorines. Um, so it doesn't really matter which way you surround it. You could put two over here and then one on the top, or you could put two over here and then one on the bottom. Uh, so there's multiple ways of doing it, but the boron, let's just surround it by the fluorines and we match up any unpaired electrons. So the three electrons on the boron, just make sure they're matched up with those three uh, lone electrons on the three fluorines. And that's where they're gonna bond, okay? So now that they're matched up, let's go ahead and bond them together. So there'll be a single covalent bond here, here, and here. And so that is the Lewis structure of BF3. 
And again, you can verify that by checking the common bonding patterns. Boron has three single bonds and the fluorines each have one. Let's just verify. Yes, boron has three single bonds. That's what it likes to do. And the halogens, fluorine is in the halogen com column, so it likes to form one single bond. And so using the common bonding patterns, you can see that this is correct. And the fluorines all have their octet, okay? The boron is one of the exceptions to the octet rule. You see uh, it doesn't quite have an octet, but it's one of the exceptions, like hydrogen is also an exception. Okay, so here is the Lewis structure. Now, um, to get to the three-dimensional shape, we again use that table, okay? So looking at the central atom, you count how many groups around the central atom, and groups are either other atoms that, it, that the central atom is connected to or lone pairs on the central atom. So I count one, two, three atoms, and I don't see any lone pairs. So that's three groups total on boron. And let's go to table 4.2 and let's look for three groups this time. Okay, so uh, three groups, all three of them are atoms. There, there are no lone pairs. And this table says that whenever you have a central atom surrounded by three groups, they form a triangle. And the shape is called trigonal planar. Okay, so that's what the fluorines are doing around the boron. They're pointing in this direction. And so that is called trigonal planar. Sometimes I call it triangular. And this time the bond angle is 120 degrees. You go 120 degrees, another 120 degrees, another 120 degrees, and you get back. So 360 degrees total, so 120 degree bond angle. Okay, so this is trigonal planar. Now, is this molecule polar? Okay, and remember when you're asking if a molecule is polar, you're, you're really asking, does it have a negative side and does it have a positive side? So do any of the atoms in here pull electrons towards one side of the molecule, leaving the other side positive? And here you got boron and fluorine. So let's go back to that electronegativity table again. Now, interestingly, fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. Okay, it's much more electronegative than boron. And the difference this time is, is a difference of two. You know, boron is, you know, fluorine is, has an electronegativity two greater than boron. And, and that's basically, if you go to table 4.3, that's telling you that, you know, when the electronegativity difference is greater than 1.9, uh, it should be ionic. And you're thinking, wow, maybe this is an ionic bond. Maybe it's not even covalent. Maybe it's ionic. But uh, you, here you have to remember that symmetry rule again. So uh, going back to the, you know, the, the molecule, uh, this fluorine might be pulling those two electrons that way. And this one is pulling those two electrons that way. And this one's pulling those two electrons that way. And now you have like a three-way tug of war. So these three fluorines are kind of pulling electrons away from the boron. They're, they're pulling those bonded electrons away from the boron. But really, there's not really a negative side of the molecule and a positive side. That's what polarity means. You got, you know, the negative pole and the positive pole. Here, it's kind of like it's negative all the way around and it's not really a polar molecule. Maybe the middle of it might be positive, but you don't got a negative side and a positive side. That's a three-way tug of war, okay? So CO2 was a two-way tug of war. Now we see a three-way tug of war and this is also nonpolar. All right, now to name this molecule, you got one boron, you got three fluorines, so mono and tri, you got mono boron trifluoride. Remember the last one gets the ide. And then anytime the first element has just one, you can drop the mono prefix. So it's just boron trifluoride. 
Okay. And, and I'll show you an example of a, of a boron trifluoride here. So here's its shape. It's a trigonal planar structure. And uh, so pretty cool. You know, they all line up in a, in a plane. So perfectly triangular. For our next um, three examples, uh, we will do uh, three that are discussed in your textbook, CH4, uh, NH3, and H2O. Now the first one is methane, the second one is ammonia, and the third one is of course water. Methane, ammonia, and water. Now, now your, your author shows us uh, you know, a picture of, of what some of the uses of these compounds are. So I'll, I'll point you to that picture real quick. This is in, in chapter four. So methane, this is a gas that's uh, released from decomposing organic matter. And, and your, your author shows you an example where uh, you have a flooded rice paddy. So what happens is, you know, when farmers grow rice, uh, they flood the fields. And, uh, you know, by flooding the fields, that water cuts off the oxygen to the microorganisms in the soil. And uh, that helps stimulate anaerobic fermentation. And, you know, one of the products of anaerobic fermentation is the production of methane gas. And so flooded rice paddies actually produce quite a bit of methane gas. You know, some people worry about it. And, uh, but you get a lot of methane gas coming out of rice paddies and and there you go. So your author, uh, you know, uh, also shows you, uh, you know, the, the Lewis structure and the, and, and the molecular shape here. Now, ammonia, uh, the, next, the next example is uh, ammonia NH3. And um, ammonia is one of the, you know, ingredients of fertilizer. Okay, so fertilizer uses quite a bit of ammonia. Uh, nitrogen is good to put in the ground. It helps your plants. But ammonia is also one of the chemicals that's in urine as well. So not too pleasant to smell. And the last one is, of course, water. And, and water is, is all over the place. So, you know, river of water. So this is a pretty cool picture in your textbook. All right, let's go through the structures of these three compounds. Uh, methane is CH4, so you have one carbon and four hydrogens. You draw the Lewis dot structures of the atoms. Carbon gets four dots and the hydrogens get one. And uh, remind you, carbon is in group 4A, so it gets four dots. And hydrogen in group 1A gets one dot. So the periodic table tells you how to do the dot structure of the atoms. Now you position the atoms next to each other and, and you can see here what's going to happen because carbon has four single electrons and, and they are looking to match up with other single electrons. Well, well, that's perfect because you got four hydrogens ready to pair up. And so you put the hydrogens around the, four, uh, around the carbon and you match up the unpaired electrons and, and that's where the bonding is going to occur. And so do the bonds and you get four single covalent bonds this time. And that's your Lewis structure. Now, again, the Lewis structure doesn't tell you what the shape of the molecule is. It just tells you how the atoms are connected and what the bonding is. So carbon is simultaneously connected to the four hydrogens, but it is not a flat structure. Okay, to get the three dimensional shape of the molecule, you need the help of that table 4.2 again. Okay, so the Lewis structure doesn't tell you the shape. So let's go to table 4.2. Uh, oh yeah, we forgot to count the number of groups. So looking at the central atom, let's count the number of groups again. So on the central atom, I count one, two, three, four atoms, and I don't see any lone pairs. So four groups total, there's no lone pairs, four groups total. So going to the table, now we go down to four, and, and there's a few different options for four, okay? Four groups total, and all four of them are atoms, okay? All four of them are atoms. There are no lone pairs, 
okay? There, there's not three atoms in one lone pair like the next row, but it's this one. And whenever you have this situation, the shape of the molecule is tetrahedral. It's a tetrahedral shape. Okay, the carbon is in the middle of the tetrahedron and it's surrounded by the four hydrogens. Now, a tetrahedron is kind of like a triangular based pyramid. Okay, and I'll show you a model of, uh, of methane here just so you can get a better understanding of what a tetrahedron is. You, you see, a tetrahedron is a triangular based pyramid and um, it's hard, you know, each of these four hydrogens are, are kind of equivalent. If you put another one on top, you can't tell you know, there's any different. Okay. Um, so, you know, they're kind of like the four hydrogens are in equivalent positions. There's nothing special about this top one here. Okay. So that's a tetrahedron right there. And that's the shape of this molecule. So uh, sometimes if you want to indicate a tetrahedron on paper, you, um, you can uh, position it like that. And then you see on paper, uh, you can do dashed lines to indicate a hydrogen going back into the paper and then wedges for hydrogens coming out of the paper. And you, you can see how this kind of corresponds with that over there. Okay, so, so there's your tetrahedral structure right there. You don't have to worry about how to draw three-dimensional structures on paper. I'm just showing it to you in case you see it at some point in the future. So here's your Lewis structure. That carbon is tetrahedral. The bond angle is about 109.5 degrees. Now, is this molecule polar? Well, um, determining whether or not it's polar, we can go to that, that, that table again that table of electronegativities, and I'll, I'll show it to you one more time. Um, here it is right here. Now, carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5 and hydrogen's electronegativity is 2.1. That's not a big difference. And in table 4.3, we're told that whenever the difference is less than 0.5, the bond should be considered nonpolar. Okay, uh, there's something else that I think would help you understand or maybe remember this table without having to constantly cite it. So uh, here I've drawn a little portion of that table and, and the ones that I've highlighted in blue, those are the very electronegative elements. If you see one of them in your molecule, those are the ones that have a larger electronegativity and those are the ones you need to, to you know to to make note of okay so if you have like a, a, a fluorine attached to carbon well that's going to be a polar bond fluorine would be pulling electrons away from carbon but if you're just dealing with the black elements like carbon and hydrogen also um, you don't have to worry about electronegativity and and that's the case here um, you know, uh, we just have carbons and hydrogens. There are no electronegative elements in here. This is a nonpolar molecule. Okay. Now, what is the name of this? You have one carbon, four hydrogens. So that's mono and tetra. So that's monocarbon tetrahydride. Monocarbon tetrahydride. Drop that mono prefix on the first element. So carbon tetrahydride but everybody calls this methane. Here's your systematic name, but everyone calls it methane. Now the next one, um, NH3, which is uh, known as ammonia. It's that fertilizer. It's also found in urine. Let's take a look at its structure. So NH3, you have one nitrogen and three hydrogens. You, you draw the dot structures of the atoms. There they are. Nitrogen is in group 5A. So uh, the elements in group 5A get five dots and hydrogen gets one dot. So here you go. Those are the dot structures. And you can see that the three unpaired dots on the nitrogen are going to go to the three hydrogens. So simply move them into position and form the bonds. It's a pretty straightforward procedure. 
Now, this is the Lewis structure. That nitrogen you know, kind of chopped off those two uh, electrons up there. So there is a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen. Here they are, but, but they are right there. So this is the Lewis structure. It's not telling us the actual shape. It's just telling us that nitrogen is connected to the three hydrogens at the same time. And it also has a, a lone pair of electrons up there. Okay. So uh, nitrogen is also more electronegative than the hydrogens are. <clears throat> so remember nitrogen is one of those blue ones and the blue atoms are more electronegative than the black ones and they pull electrons away from the black ones. And so this nitrogen is kind of, uh, it's not really an equal sharing between nitrogen and hydrogen. It's pulling these electrons away from hydrogen. It's pulling those bonded electrons away from that hydrogen. It's pulling these bonded electrons away from that hydrogen. So I've drawn little blue arrows. These are representing the bond dipoles that those three polar bonds that the nitrogen is sharing. And, uh, but before you determine whether or not the molecule is polar, you need to get to the actual molecular shape. So don't ask whether or not the molecule is polar before you know the shape of the molecule. So let's get the shape first. So there might be three polar bonds, but maybe they all cancel off, like what we saw happened with BF3. Okay, so let's just get the shape first before we determine the polarity of the molecule. So the central atom, I count one, two, three other atoms that it's attached to, and there is a fourth lone pair. So there's four groups total, three are atoms and one lone pair. So four total, three atoms, one lone pair. Let's go back to that uh, table 4.2 again. So we're going to four groups this time. This time it's three atoms, one lone pair. And this table tells us that the shape is called trigonal pyramidal. Okay, what a trigonal pyramidal shape is, is it's just like tetrahedral, but imagine removing maybe one of these atoms, maybe the top one, and putting the lone pair there. And what you're left with is kind of like a little, you know, a squashed, you know, triangular pyramid on the bottom. Okay, and I'll show you a, a model of, of a NH3. So it's trigonal pyramidal, that's the name of the the structure, so here's a model of it. You know, I've tried, tried to show you with uh, wedges and dashes right there, but maybe you'll get a better picture of it here. So there it is, you got your nitrogen, and you know, um, so you see it's not quite flat like the, the BF3 was. You see it's sort of like, uh, you know, trigonal pyramidal, that's what you call it. And so this nitrogen right here, um, it's pulling those bonded electrons away from the hydrogen. So, so, so it's pulling these electrons in that direction. It's pulling those electrons in that direction and the other one in that direction. And so the nitrogen is kind of like, it's got a negative, you know, it's got more electrons on this side of the molecule, leaving less electrons on that side. And so this time we see this is an actual polar molecule. Those three bond dipoles, when you look at the actual three-dimensional shape, they don't cancel off. So the nitrogen is kind of sucking electrons. Let's sort of position this like it is in the, in the picture. Um, it's hard to rotate this thing. Okay, there you go. So you got one kind of going back into the paper, the other one coming out at you, that's the wedge, and then one going off to the right. So that looks kind of like that right there, all right? That looks kind of like that. And so the top of the molecule where the nitrogen is, it's kind of sucking electrons up to the top. This would be the negative part of the molecule and the, where the hydrogens are on the bottom would be the positive end. So this is a polar molecule. You got your poles, your negative pole, your positive pole, all right? Now, the reason polarity is important, we'll see in, uh, in a later chapter, I think uh, once we get to chapter seven, that when you have more than one molecule, what actually happens is the molecules like to stack together and align their polar characters. So the positive side of the one on top 
will match up with the negative side of the one next to it. And you get kind of this chain, you know, chain interaction. And these are called in intermolecular interactions. And intermolecular interactions help explain why uh, molecules like to stick together in the liquid phase and in the solid phase. That's the glue. That's the mysterious glue that holds them together. It has to do with their polar character. So NH3 is a trigonal pyramidal molecule. It's its Lewis structure, that's its shape, and it is polar. And the name of this would simply be, you know, mononitrogen trihydride. You can drop the mono prefix. So nitrogen trihydride, but everybody calls it ammonia. Now, we've all seen H2O, so this is water. Its Lewis structure is pretty simple. You got two hydrogens, one oxygen. You know, the hydrogens have one dot, oxygen gets six. And that's perfect because the oxygen has two unpaired electrons to match up with the two hydrogens. So thinking symmetry, you put oxygen in the middle and then uh, the unpaireds are matched up and you can make the bonds right there. And here's the Lewis structure. And you can verify this if you want. Uh, oxygen has its common bonding pattern. Uh, you know, uh, this time it has the two singles. So that's one of the bonding patterns for oxygen and the hydrogens look like that. So that's a good structure. Now, what is the shape? So uh, the oxygen uh, has one, two atoms, and then a lone pair up here and a lone pair down there. That's four groups total, okay? Two atoms and then two lone pairs makes four total. So let's go to that table, all right? So four groups, but two of them are atoms and two of them are lone pairs. And this table tells us that that corresponds to a bent structure. And all a bent structure is, is if you imagine the, the, you know, four groups, but this time you have two of these positions or lone pairs. So maybe that one here and maybe that one there. What you would be left with is a bent structure. And that's what water is, a bent structure. The other two positions are occupied by lone pairs now. So the bond angle is about the same, you know, 109.5. So that's how you use that table. So water's Lewis structure is that, but most people draw it like a little... V, you know, so there it is. And, and oxygen is much more electronegative than hydrogen. It, it's, uh, in fact, the second most electronegative element on the periodic table. Um, so, you know, I'll remind you one more time that, uh, you know, the, the electronegativity table, uh, oxygen is uh, got electronegativity of 3.5. Fluorine is the most but oxygen is 3.5, and that's much greater than hydrogen's 2.1. So that falls well within the, the, the polar covalent range. The difference between 2.1 and 3.5 is 1.4. Okay, so that's well within the polar covalent range. Okay, so the, the bonds are polar covalent bonds here. And uh, going back to water, uh, yes, the oxygen is pulling these bonded electrons towards it in that direction. It's pulling those two bonded electrons towards it in that direction. And so this side of the molecule is actually negative and the other side is positive. Well, we put this partial sign here. So it's not quite like a full on negative ion, you know, um, it's not quite a full negative ion. It's just got like a partially negative character on the one side and a partially positive character on the other side. That's what this, you know, this symbol represents partially positive and negative. Okay, so there is the, the Lewis structure, which also has the three dimensional shape in there. Okay, and you can see the polar character. Now, uh, so we say that this is bent, it is polar. In the name of the molecule this time, you got two hydrogens, one oxygen. So dihydrogen, monoxide. You don't drop the mono prefix if it's on the last element. You only drop it when it's on the first element in the formula. So dihydrogen monoxide. Um, we, we know it as water, of course. Now it sounds dangerous, doesn't it? Dihydrogen monoxide and 
Uh, every time I hear that, uh, I always call it water, but every time I hear dihydrogen monoxide, I think of this, this group of you know, rascals who went onto a college campus one time back in the 90s, I think, or maybe the early 2000s, and they got a bunch of uh, college students to sign a petition to ban dihydrogen monoxide from their drinking water. And these idiots signed the petition. You know, it's, it's so easy to, you know, to get college students to, you know, to get upset over things and to make them protest. And, and so these, these dodos uh, ended up banning dihydrogen monoxide from their drinking water. <laughs> Because after all, it is dangerous uh, stuff. It's the number one cause for drowning. Um, you know, there's all kinds of dangers from this, you know, substance right here. And, and so they were able to convince these uh, students to, you know, to ban it. Um, now, like ammonia, um, the polar character of the ammonia molecules uh, helps cause intermolecular interactions between them Water does as well. You see, water is a polar molecule, a very polar molecule. And when you have multiple water molecules, they, they like to stack together with the negative side interacting with the positive side of its neighbor. And so water has these strong intermolecular interactions as well, which we'll discuss when we get to chapter seven. All right, um, now um, let's go through a few more examples. Uh, the next one is, uh, we'll do, try to do them a little bit more quickly now, since, since we're getting used to the, the procedure. Um, okay, CH2O, CH2O. Now, you have one carbon, two hydrogens, and an oxygen. The carbon has four dots, the hydrogens have one, and the oxygen has six. So here are the atoms, these are the puzzle pieces, and and how do you fit them together? Well, it turns out that the arrangement is gonna look like this. You got the carbon surrounded by all of the other ones. If you tried to flip carbon and oxygen's position, you put oxygen in the middle, surrounded by carbon and the hydrogen, you would run into trouble. You can try that, but you will run into trouble. You'll see that you won't be able to satisfy the octet rule and you won't have common bonding patterns. So put it like this, okay? Carbon likes to be central, all right? Um, and uh, here you go. So you, you see that you're gonna have these two form a bond, those two form a bond, those two form a bond, but what about this one and that one? Well, they're gonna come together and be a double bond, okay? And when, when you form the bonds, uh, you'll end up with that right there. And you see I've kind of jumped straight to the the actual shape of the molecule. So this is a trigonal planar molecule because carbon is surrounded by three atoms and zero lone pairs. Three atoms, zero lone pairs, that's trigonal planar structure. Okay, now if you're wondering if the molecule is polar, well, you know, the only atom that you have to look out for is the oxygen. The carbons and hydrogens, remember those are the, uh, they're not very electronegative, those are the black ones, but the oxygen is blue. Okay, this is a very electronegative atom and it's gonna be pulling electrons away from the carbon. Okay, so this is a polar bond. These double bonded electrons are being kind of pulled closer to the oxygen. So the molecule is polar in this case. And we could name this Let's see, monocarbon, dihydrogen, monoxide. You drop the mono prefix. So maybe carbon, dihydrogen, monoxide, but no one calls it that. Everybody calls it formaldehyde. Okay, so when you get into organic compounds that are carbon-based, um, you know, there's a whole different type of naming and, you know, you could call it carbon, dihydrogen, monoxide, but, uh, you know, it's, it's formaldehyde. Okay, in the organic chemistry community. And this stuff is actually embalming fluid. This is how you preserve bodies. So formaldehyde helps preserve uh, bodies. Next example is CH3OH. The reason you're being given the chemical formula like this is because we're getting to lots of atoms now. And when you have lots and lots of atoms in a, in a formula, you need to kind of uh, help the reader 
understand how the atoms are connected. So uh, rather than just CH4O, I'm, I'm gonna help you out here. CH3, these atoms are close together, and then OH, those atoms are close together, okay? So we'll write the dot structures of all the atoms, CH3, here they are, and then OH, another couple. And then if you assemble them properly, they're gonna look like this, okay? And you can see that the carbon is gonna form four single bonds, and the oxygen is gonna form two single bonds, okay? And, and you can verify the common bonding patterns. So the carbon is gonna have four single bonds, the oxygen's two singles. Let's go back to the common bonding patterns. The carbon's gonna look like this. The oxygen's gonna look like that. And uh, there you go. So um, we'll just jump straight to the three-dimensional Lewis structure here. This carbon is going to be uh, a tetrahedral carbon with four single bonds, this carbon is gonna have four atoms that it's attached to. I don't see any lone pairs on the carbon, just a single bond here, there, and there, and then one there. So four atoms, zero lone pairs, uh, and that's tetrahedral, okay? So that carbon is gonna be tetrahedral right there. Now we also have another central atom that we need to ask about its geometry. And this oxygen, what is uh, you know geometry around it? Well, I count, looking at the oxygen now, I count one, two atoms, and then two lone pairs. So four groups total, but two of them are atoms and the other two are lone pairs. This is kind of like water that we saw before. You see the oxygen is connected to two other atoms and it has two lone pairs. That's like the water, two atoms and two lone pairs. So this oxygen is also bent like the water was. So whenever you have a molecule with multiple central atoms, you need to indicate the geometry around each of them. The carbon's tetrahedral, the oxygen is bent. And this substance right here, you could try to name it carbon tetrahydrogen monoxide, but no one calls it this. This is an organic substance. We'll just call it methanol. Okay, so that's methanol. It's an alcohol. It's the smallest alcohol molecule. And I'll show you um, a model of methanol right here. There you go. So there's methanol. Whoops, stop that. There we go. Now, um, interesting thing about uh, single bonds is, is single bonds can rotate. So, so you can have like the, the three, you know, hydrogens over here and then, and then that, and then this part can rotate. So if these stay fixed, this single bond can rotate. So this hydrogen can be like circling around over on this side. The molecule doesn't have a fixed shape. You know, bonds are able to rotate. So when you get to more complex molecules, uh, their shape changes, but the geometry around specific atoms stays the same. So no matter what this bond is rotating over here, this one is still remaining tetrahedral and that one's still remaining bent. Okay, it might be bent in this direction over there, but it's still bent. So there you go, that's, that's methanol. Th this is not an alcohol that that's not an alcohol you'd want to consume, okay? A very, very toxic substance, much more toxic than ethanol. So ethanol is our next example uh, in here. I'm cluing you into the structure again, CH3, CH2OH. So writing the dot structures of all of the atoms in that order, CH3, CH2OH. Okay, carbon gets four dots, hydrogens get one, oxygen gets six. And assembling them properly, you're gonna put these three hydrogens next to that carbon. They're gonna to attach to that carbon. Those two hydrogens are gonna to go to the second carbon. And the last hydrogen goes to the oxygen. And so that's how they're assembled. And you can see that this carbon is gonna have four single bonds. The next one also four single bonds and the oxygen is gonna have two single bonds again. And what you're left with is a tetrahedral carbon. You know, this carbon is connected to one, 
two, three, four atoms. I don't see any lone pairs, so that's tetrahedral. This carbon is connected to one, two, three, four atoms, no lone pairs, so that's also tetrahedral. But the oxygen has one, two atoms and two lone pairs. That's like water again, so this oxygen is bent. And so here is maybe a, uh, you know, an attempt at drawing a three-dimensional Lewis structure. And I'll show you uh, quickly uh, a model of ethanol. So here is ethanol. It looks kind of like a dog or something. You got your dog's head and nose. So anyway, you see this one is tetrahedral. That's one tetrahedral and that one's bent. And of course the single bonds rotate. And, and so this molecule is constantly changing shape, but um, even if it changes shape, the, this will still be tetrahedral and tetrahedral and that will still be bent. Okay, so that's ethanol. This is the alcohol that uh, people like to consume. Okay, much less toxic than methanol. Now, um, Ethanol is, a, is also a polar molecule. I, I think we might have skipped the polarity of methanol. Methanol is polar because it has the oxygen. The oxygen is pulling electrons away from the carbon and the hydrogen. And ethanol is doing that too. You remember um, when, you're, when you're determining the polarity of a molecule, uh, you're just looking for really these four elements and, and oxygen is the big one okay look for oxygen and nitrogen remember or you know in biochemistry we have hydrogen carbon oxygen nitrogen those are the big four okay hydrogen and carbon are not electronegative but nitrogen and oxygen are so if you see one of them it's pulling electrons away from the other ones and so here you got that oxygen and it's pulling these electrons away from that carbon it's pulling those electrons away from that hydrogen so yes this is this is going to be like a little negative region of the molecule okay so this is it's going to be a polar molecule okay, it's hard to tell where the negative and positive side is maybe this is the negative part and that's the positive part over there um, so when you get to larger molecules you instead of talking about negative and positive side you kind of talk about little polar regions so this is a polar region. And I'm not even gonna to attempt to name this systematically because everybody calls it ethanol. Okay, dicarbon, hexahydrogen, monoxide. No way, ethanol. Okay, the next example is um, CH3, COOH. Okay, you're, you're being clued into the structure again with this type of formula. Okay, so the three hydrogens go with that carbon. This oxygen goes with that carbon. And then the other two also connect to that carbon. And, and here are the dot structures of the atoms. If you position them properly, they're going to look like that. Okay, the two oxygens actually don't attach together like you might think in the formula. Uh, this one goes to the carbon and the, and the other one also goes to the carbon after it, but separately. Okay, so here is how they're supposed to be arranged. And I forgot one of the electrons on carbon, but it's supposed to come up here to match up with that other one on oxygen. You're gonna form a double bond to that oxygen on top. All right, now here is the three-dimensional Lewis structure for, for this molecule right here. And the first carbon has one, two, three, four atoms, no lone pairs, that's tetrahedral. The second carbon has one, two, three atoms, no lone pair, so that's going to be trigonal planar, like that triangle. And then the fourth, or, or the, the oxygen over here, that's also a central atom. There's one, two atoms, and two lone pairs. So that's like water again, so that's bent. Now this is uh, definitely a polar substance. You got a couple oxygens in there that are pulling the electrons away from the carbon, and this one's pulling electrons away from that carbon and that hydrogen. So this bond is being pulled that way, uh, this bond is being pulled that way, this one's being pulled that way. And, and so you got three polar covalent bonds and they're not canceled off. I don't see like any symmetry here. So this is a polar molecule. This is a very polar region of the molecule. And this is called acetic acid. Acetic acid is what you have in vinegar. Okay, so acetic acid is, uh, 
in vinegar. It's also one of the products of uh, fermentation in biochemistry. And I'll show you a model, uh, a model of acetic acid. I think I got one here. So there you go. So acetic acid, you see that CH3, that tetrahedral carbon, that CO and that OH. See so tetrahedral, trigonal, planar, and then bent. So acetic acid. Of course, the molecule is constantly, you know, the bonds are being rotated. So, so the, there's no fixed shape overall, but you can talk about the shapes of the three central atoms. All right, we're getting towards the end. Um, here is a big one, NH2, CH2, COOH. Now this is an amino acid right here. This is one of the 20 amino acids that are important in biochemistry. One, you know, the one of the ones that make up proteins. And this is the formula for glycine. Okay, this is glycine, the smallest amino acid out there. There are many others, histidine, phenylalanine, you know, you got uh, 20, maybe 22 of them or something, 20 common ones. Okay, to get the Lewis structure of this is pretty involved and I'm gonna, uh, you know, kind of do it quickly. Uh, so you put the dot structures of all the atoms and position them next to each other the way they're supposed to go. So I'm kind of helping you out here. So here's the dot structures of all of the atoms and those atoms are positioned how they're supposed to connect together. And after we connect them together properly, it'll look like that. Now you can verify this is a correct structure by looking at any one atom and verifying that it's in its common bonding pattern. So this nitrogen has a lone pair and three single bonds. And, and going back, uh, you can see uh, nitrogen, you know, uh, one of its bonding patterns is a lone pair and three single bonds. Okay. And uh, you can do that for the rest of the um, atoms in there to carbon. One of its bonding patterns is four single bonds. Another one is a double and two singles. And oxygen can have two lone pairs and two singles like water. And so this is correct. Everybody's in their common bonding pattern. Um, all of the atoms except for hydrogen have octets. So this is a good Lewis structure. Now you got four central atoms, the nitrogen, the carbon, the carbon, and the oxygen. This one, you have one, two, three atoms and one lone pair. That's four groups total, but one of them is a lone pair, so that's gonna be your trigonal pyramidal nitrogen. So this right here is, is kind of like that ammonia that we saw before. Okay, three single bonds, one lone pair. Let's go back to that uh, NH3. So you see three single bonds, one lone pair. That's trigonal pyramidal trigonal pyramidal nitrogen. And this carbon is tetrahedral. Anytime carbon has four single bonds, it's attached to four atoms, it's tetrahedral. This carbon is trigonal planar, like that formaldehyde. Okay, trigonal planar. Let's go back to the formaldehyde. There it is. And uh, so that's trigonal planar too. And this oxygen is bent. So this looks like water. You know, you have H over here. And instead of H over there, that's the rest of the molecule. But you know, uh, the oxygen with two single bonds is uh, bent. Now this molecule definitely is polar. You have three very electronegative atoms here. You know, remind you that uh, the nitrogen and oxygen are both electronegative. And so they're, they're pulling electrons. So this nitrogen is pulling electrons away from everybody that it's connected to. So this bond, that bond, that bond, it's all being pulled towards the nitrogen, up towards that trigonal pyramidal nitrogen. And then uh, this oxygen is pulling them away from that carbon. This oxygen is pulling these away from that carbon, away from that hydrogen. So definitely some polar regions of the molecule. The molecule is very polar. And again, this is the amino acid glycine. And I'll show you a model of glycine. Um, Okay, so here you go. There you go. So glycine, you got your NH2, CH2, uh, COOH. So trigonal pyramidal, tetrahedral, trigonal planar, 
and then bent. So glycine. Now, um, okay, so we're almost done. H2O2, you have seen this stuff before in your drugstore. This is your hydrogen peroxide. This is used as an antiseptic. And its Lewis structure is pretty simple, actually. You got two hydrogens, they're gonna go on the outside of the molecule and the two oxygens will be in the middle. And these two oxygens will connect right there to form a single bond. And these will connect right there to form another single bond. And uh, there you go. So that's a molecule of hydrogen peroxide. And uh, I don't have a model to show you, but both of these oxygens are bent. So, so the molecule kind of looks like that. Okay, you have an oxygen is bent and the other oxygen is bent. And in this molecule, you know, the single bond can rotate, but, but both oxygens are bent. Okay, now this molecule is also um, polar, you know, uh, so, so this oxygen, you know, the oxygens are kind of pulling electrons um, uh, away from the hydrogens and uh, it looks like it's, you know, kind of cancels off here. That's because it, I'm drawing this molecule as linear, but it's not linear. It's a, uh, you know, if I were to draw it correctly, the hydrogen would go up in this direction, be bent, and the other hydrogen would go up in that direction, it would also be bent. So it'd be asymmetric, it'd be a polar molecule. And you could call this dihydrogen dioxide if you want, but no one does that. Uh, you know, again, many molecules have, are, are known by their common names, hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so our last example, you thought you were done. Our last example is uh, uh, in the textbook, it was listed as the, 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 first, um, the first covalent compound that we saw in the chapter, all right, acetaminophen. Acetaminophen, that's a drug. And uh, this drug has uh, an interesting, um, let's see, an interesting structure. Where is the structure for that? Um, here we go. So extra strength Tylenol, the active ingredient is acetaminophen. And here is the formula for acetaminophen. Minifin, it's C8H9NO2. Now imagine if you were asked to draw the Lewis structure for that and you were not clued into how the atoms are connected. You know, that would be impossible. There would be, uh, there would be probably many different ways to do it. And in the next uh, video, we'll talk about isomers. So when you have just a chemical formula like that, you might, uh, you know, there might be multiple different structures that correspond to that. But, but here's one of them. And, and this right here, this arrangement of atoms um, is, uh, is the molecule acetaminophen and quite complex structure. Um, you know, you can look at any one atom and determine its, um, its shape. So, so this oxygen right here is bent this carbon right here is trigonal planar. That one's also trigonal planar. And, and this nitrogen is trigonal pyramidal. This carbon is tetrahedral. And, and so here's the Lewis structure for acetaminophen. Uh, you know, here's the ball and stick model right there. And so anyway, you know, when, when you get to larger, more complex molecules, it's, um, it, you know, it's pretty, it's a pretty involved process for drawing the Lewis structures. And so in the next video, we're gonna, maybe not the next one, the one after, um, might be the next one. We're gonna talk about how to represent really large molecules more easily by their skeletal structures. But this is acetaminophen and here, you know, here's its full Lewis structure and here's its ball and stick model, but we'll see that there is a, a, an easier way to draw Lewis structures when you get to very large molecules. Okay, it takes forever to draw this. And so we'll, we'll be using skeletal structures to represent larger molecules.
So that's it for this video. Uh, we went through quite a lot of examples, maybe uh, 10 or 11 or 12 or something. And in our next video, we will discuss um, resonance and isomers. So stay tuned for that. Aloha.